children's worship through the side doors. While they're doing that, you can turn to Luke chapter 6. There's a listening guide in the bulletin you can use to follow along with as well. Luke chapter 6, I'm going to begin with verse 27. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one, treat, one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to, lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. <clears throat> And you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. We've been talking this month about tough subjects, and today we're going to talk about marriage and family. And, and I would prefer to talk about marriage and family in terms of a joyful series, in terms of a series where it's all roses series, or Life is Grand series, but too often marriage and family uh, becomes a tough subject for many of us, and too often we say things like this, if my spouse would only, and we fill in the blank, if my parents would only, and we fill in the blank with our expectations, them if my children would only and we fill in the blanks with that so I want to establish right off the bat this morning in this message that this is a no elbow message your elbows have to stay tight right none of this elbows got to stay tight during the message this morning because I don't want to talk about your spouse or your children or your parents or your cousin or your aunt or your uncle and all those dynamics. I, I want us to talk this morning about being the right kind of person in our families. And, and that is a tough subject because I would prefer for preachers to solve the problems that my family members have and not my problem. But I want us to focus on being the right kind of person in our families today. Ephesians 4, which really is a great passage about family life that we let degenerate into other conversations, but it, it talks about how we relate to one another in the family. And Paul writes, submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. Great word, great phrase, great idea for family. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And then a few verses later in that passage, Paul says what would have been the most radical thing these people had ever heard uh, about family life and their culture. He says husbands ought to love their wives like their own bodies. And you would have just heard deafening silence. They would have been stunned that somebody suggested that in that culture. And yet too often when we hear those words about the families, about our marriages, we say, yeah, but I can't love my spouse like that. And then a few verses later, Paul brings in the children. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Don't dig at them until you break their spirit. Destroy them. Make them rebellious. Don't do that. And parents will say, well, you don't know my kids. I got to stay on top of them. You don't know what it's like in my house. And parents are saying, I cannot love like that. And 
little bit later, he says, children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. And too many young people say, man, you don't know what creeps my parents are. I can't love like that. And our homes break down. And our homes are hurt. And they're torn apart. And it breaks your heart to to experience that or to watch that happen in others. It's a tough subject. And the passage that I read this morning that seems totally out of place when we're talking about marriage and families, in my estimation, is too real for many marriages and families. Because the word that I would too often use to describe how families are relating to each other is is we've got situations where we're enemies to one another. And every now and then, really full-scale war breaks out in our families. And so let me, let me just say gently, but with a fair amount of challenge this morning, if we can't love our husband or our wife like the Bible asks us to, can we at least love them like we were to love an enemy? Can we do that? C- can we love the people we live with at least as much as we're to love our enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that for you? Even sinners do that. And we realize pretty quickly in the Bible that when the Bible speaks of love, it is speaking about something different than what our culture speaks of in love. Jesus makes it clear, my kind of love accepted you and me when we were unacceptable, loved you and me when we were unlovable, forgave you and me when we were unforgivable. That's that's Jesus' kind of love. And and Jesus says, if if you're going to accept that love, if you're going to claim that love, then I expect you to give that love to others in my name. And yet so often, a husband or a wife will say, I don't love you anymore. And and what that statement means is, I had a contract with you when we were married. I didn't tell you, but I had a contract. And, And in that contract, I said, as long as you made me happy, as long as you kept yourself together, as long as you gave me the attention that I thought I needed and and you, you helped me do the things I wanted to do, then I'd love you. And if you stop doing that, I don't love you anymore. And that unstated contract has become way too prominent in our culture, in our churches, and in our homes. And sadly, many children have gotten the idea that love from their parents means stuff, and activities. And so we run like crazy to make enough money to give them stuff or to get them to activities. If you don't believe me, park yourself out in front of a drive through restaurant between about 4.30 and 6, Monday to Friday, and just watch breaking our necks, trying to prove we love our kids. And when we fall short 
And when that breaks down, because it's unsustainable and it will break down, our kids feel unloved. Because the only way they've known to understand love is through stuff and getting me to activities. And what the world calls love, what our culture calls love, and what Jesus calls love, it's not the same thing at all. When Jesus speaks about love, it's a verb, not a noun. In our culture, many of us think of love as a noun. I haven't found love, or I am in love. But when Jesus speaks of love, it's a verb. And when the Bible uses love as a noun, it uses it in reference to who Jesus is. Jesus is love. Love is something we do. And when we do love, feelings follow. Feelings always will follow our actions. And love in our culture has become reactive, which is back to this passage. Jesus said, in this world, you'll find people who will say, I will love you when you're loving me. I'll help you when you're helping me. I'll be nice to you when you are nice to me. I'll be kind when you're kind to me. That's the world's kind of love. It's action and reaction. That's not love, according to the one who went to death expressing his love for us. And so our kind of love is to be the kind of love we have learned from him. And because we've been so confused about love in our culture and in our church and in our families, we end up with a lot of hurting people among us and around us. And some of us are hurting so much today that we can't think of anything except how much we hurt. And when we're at that spot, it makes us unlovable, makes us unacceptable sometimes because we're looking desperately for someone to, to take that hurt away, for somebody to take that pain away. And it's all we can think about. It's all we can function in. So when somebody asks us to be loving to our spouse or to our kids or to our parents or to our aunt or whoever, it, it just is impossible because we're hurting so much. And in our community, we hurt so much that we turn to drugs and alcohol because it relieves the pain. Hear me now. What I have found every time, 100% of the time, that I've encountered the drug and alcohol solution to the hurt, it just makes it worse. Every single time. But many of us, when we're hurting so much, turn to that. And, and again, hear me, I'm, I'm not talking just about people that we read about in newspapers. I'm talking about what's happening in many of our homes on Friday nights, on Saturdays, after work. Uh, let's, not, let's not push this off to somebody else. I'm talking about what's happening too much among us. And then too many are taking their lives in this community because they hurt so much and they're trying to escape that. And we know that, that Jesus Christ can do for us what no one else can do and he can, he can bring us into life even when we're in our deepest pain and deepest hurt. But you lose sight of that when you're hurt. And God says to us, I've done two things to provide opportunities for people to deal with hurt. 
I, I've given my people the opportunity to love like I love. And I've given them the home and the church. And, and in those two institutions, the home and the church, now, now I know we live in a day where it is trendy to talk about how inefficient and ineffective the home and the church are, those institutions are, those out-of-date institutions. I know it's easy to talk about how much they're irrelevant. But friends, the story of my life is I've been shaped through the home and the church. And in the home and in the church, we should be expressing God's love to one another. The kind of love that says, I will do to others as I would have them do to me. I will treat them as I want to be treated. And it will change our world if we'll love like God has asked us to do in our homes and in our church. Now, now for many of us, that starts with forgiveness. There, there's some stuff in our families, and there's some stuff in our relationship with the church that, that forgiveness needs to happen with. And we talked about that the first week of this Tough Subject series, and I said then I could preach on forgiveness, I think, about 46 Sundays a year, and it's relevant. But friends, don't mishear me. Uh, we can talk about all the exciting things we can do in the life of this church, and I, I am genuinely excited about where we are and where we're going. But unforgiveness will completely derail us and will take the future away. And see, I, I, I can't print that in a bulletin, right? There, there's nothing I can do with PowerPoint or a song that Alex can sing or something I can preach that'll make some forgiveness issues happen. That, that's just stuff that we've got to trust God to do, and, and we've got to start taking some steps forward on. And so I understand that, that the kind of love we're talking about for many of us, whether it's in our families or in our church, starts with forgiveness. And, and forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an action. Right? You're, you're probably never going to feel like forgiving, <laughs> at least if your life's anything like mine. Never felt like it, but it's an action. And, and there ought to be a place where people can go that loves us when we're unlovable, accepts us when we're unacceptable, forgives us when we're un unforgivable. And God says that place is the home and the church. And it's easy for us to say, Dan, we can't love like that. That's so far beyond us. And so, Dan, it's, it's easier to, to start a new marriage, start a new family, go to another church. It's far easier to do that than to model the love that God talks of. And I would say we've got a We've got to experience the power of God, the Spirit of God, if we're going to love like this. Because when we're filled with the Spirit of God, when we're empowered by Jesus Christ, the first listing of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And when we belong to Jesus, we're to love the world like Christ loves the world. And we're only going to be able to do that in his power through his presence in our lives. Through praying and commit ourse committing ourselves to doing that. And friends, our homes need this. Our church needs this. And our community needs this more than anything else. We have to acknowledge when we talk tough subjects, that we Christians have talked too much to our culture about our definition of love and marriage and family. 
And, and every time we feel pinched by our culture about our definition of love and marriage and family, we react. And we say, this is what it is. And we feel like if we just yell loud enough or long enough, it's going to change something. It's not. They know our definition of love and marriage. They're not asking for what we think. What I believe they're open to, what I believe we should be open to, what I believe would be helpful and will change our lives and change our culture is us demonstrating love in our families. Is Dan and Emily's marriage reflecting more of Jesus Christ? Dan and Emily's relationship with our children and their ch our children with, with us reflecting more of Jesus Christ. See, the, the story of the growth of the New Testament church and, and really the story of the growth of the church for about the first three or 400 years is a story of homes, <laughs> right? We, we, we kind of read house church and say, well, that's kind of like when we do small groups in a home. No, 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 that's not what it was like at all. <laughs> that's the primary vehicle for how the church grew the first three or 400 years of its existence. It was a couple demonstrating God's love to each other so well that this couple would see it and say, wow, I got to have that in my home. And suddenly, here we go. It, it was a couple, and in that day, in, in our day, uh, slaves. So it was amazing a thing that was happening in the home. Slaves and, and people who wanted to overthrow the government and people that wanted to submit to the government and people from all kinds of different economic brackets would gather in these homes. The sick and the lame, all that kind of stuff. And they would worship God and they would love each other. Wouldn't tolerate each other. They would love each other. And the culture around them Say, well, look at that. That speaks to something in my heart and my life. And, and I want to relate to others like that. And the conversation, well, how do you do that? It's the Spirit of God. <laughs> it's the love of Jesus Christ. And the church grew and grew and grew and grew. Because they demonstrated it in their homes. And, and I'll tell you where, where my commitment is on this. Because I'd love to be interviewed by national media and all that kind of stuff. That would, that would be a good stroke to my ego. But I really can't control or have any influence over the national conversation or the cultural conversation about marriage and family. W what I can have influence over is... What's happening at my house on Robin Road <laughs> and how we can build and encourage one another in our marriages and in our families here in this church. And so this tough subject, the struggles that we have in, in our marriages and our families can be transformed by the love of God in Christ Jesus will be transformed as we model that behavior to one another. And I'll go out on a limb here and say, if we do it and do it well for five or ten years, you might see a different conversation about home and family in our culture. And again, I just base that on the first three or four hundred years of Christian history because the conversation about family and relationships and all of that changed dramatically because of the influence of the Christian home. Didn't take a referendum. They didn't appoint a judge. Didn't elect somebody. They just loved like God told them to love in their homes. It changed the world. And I believe that can happen again in our culture. And it is happening 
in other places in our world right now. Let's love each other. Let's model that love to each other. And if we're struggling today with loving that spouse, loving that child, let's, let's go back to this passage and say, even if I feel like they're my enemy, God's told me to love them and start acting out of this. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your great love. Thank you for how it changes us. Forgive us for our lack of love in our families to one another. Forgive us for speaking loudly to a culture about what they should be doing when we have some things to work on in our own lives. And Lord, with the very real understanding that Marriages are in trouble, families are in need, and those marriages are in this room and those families are in this room. I pray that you would help us hear your grace, hear your mercy, and hear your forgiveness. Let us be changed by your love. In your name we pray. Amen.